You know, we've had so much disunity in our country over the last few years and, and even more so beyond that. What we're going to talk about now is kingdom unity. We need unity in the kingdom. And Chris Broussard sat down with my very own pastor, Pastor A.R. Bernard. He's the CEO and pastor of Christian Cultural Center. He is the founder of the International Christian Brotherhood. He's always on many top list, the top pastor. In fact, the New York Times referred to him as the power pastor. Well, let's listen in to their discussion on kingdom unity. Pastor, we often say in the church that Jesus is the answer. But then when I look at the church, I see that the church is more divided or at least as divided as the world is on the issue of race. So why is that if Jesus is the answer? And of course, you're speaking specifically America. <laughs> yes, Ameri the American context story. context of American history, American story. I think it's because America has been divided uh, on the issue of race for so long. Uh, unfortunately, instead of the, the church informing the culture, the culture has informed the church historically. Uh, and by culture, it, I'm talking about those beliefs, traditions, customs, ideas and values that define a society. You know, like the myth of uh, white superiority and the myth of black inferiority in order to justify the economic system of slavery. Uh, the hermeneutic of segregation that was common, especially amongst white evangelicals, that brought a divine endorsement to the social construct of, of, of slavery. So when you have that built in to American history, you know, the church has always been divided. I will, and, and, and American society has been divided over the issue of race. And, and, and obviously, you uh, had a born-again experience years ago. I had a born-again experience years ago. And I feel like when we were born again, you had to walk away from certain things in your culture. I walked away from certain things in my culture. Am I being too simplistic to say, well, white, should have been, white Christians should have been able to walk away from the racism and the white supremacy in American society and have embraced their black brothers, you know, as brothers in Christ? Because well, that's what we're called to do as Christians. <laughs> if, if whites came to America and found white Christianity, but they didn't. They brought it with them to the New World from Europe. And in Europe, there was already from the beginning of imperialism, which lasted 600 years in colonization, global colonization, there was that myth of white superiority that was necessary. So it's not like they came and found a, an idea that they could remove themselves from. No, they brought it with them. So America was founded on the idea of white superiority. So when you know, Thomas Jefferson wrote those words uh, that was embraced that, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. Uh, he wasn't talking about black folks. He was talking about uh, uh, white men, you know, and white males, essentially. And he was relating it to the oppression of Great Britain on the colonies. Right. You know, so we weren't included in, in, in that equation, right. which goes to show that your hermeneutic is critical. The lens through which you interpret scripture and America has a history of, of, of subjective interpretation that it presents as objective fact. Mm. Mm. So they can take the Bible and try to justify the social construct of racism. Uh, they can justify um, and conflate issues of God and capitalism, God and a political party, piety and, 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 and patriotism. You know, they can conflate those things. Can you speak to how that hurts Christianity? Like when I hear, and I understand the Judeo-Christian principles that kind of underlaid the foundation of this country, and, you know, the Ten Commandments in the courtroom and things like that. Uh, the Bible being the first book that they taught children how to read from in public schools. I, I get all that. But when I hear Christians, typically white ones, saying, you know, America was this great Christian nation. It was manifest destiny, city on the hill. All, 
I feel like, first of all, that offends me as a black person and as a Christian. And I also feel like it does major damage to the gospel because when you talk about America was such a great Christian nation, you're putting slavery, chattel slavery on Christianity. You're putting rape and destruction of the family and castration, all of the tragic parts of slavery. You're putting that on Christianity. And I think a lot of mainstream whites or progressive whites turn away from Christianity because they think, well, I don't want that if that's Christianity. I think a lot, as you know, a lot of blacks are offended by that and don't want anything to do with it. I think that does major damage to the gospel and to our cause uh, when, when you put American history on Christianity. Well, you see, that's, that's beautiful, the things you just said. Why? Because you just, in what you articulated, demonstrated how little even white Americans know their own history. Because the, America is not constitutionally a Christian nation. Right. It is culturally and ceremonially a Christian nation. And the whole idea of one nation under God added to the Pledge of Allegiance, in God we trust added to our money, the conflation of God and, and, and free enterprise or capitalism, uh, God and a political party, the conflation of spiritual Israel and America as spiritual Israel, that happened in the 20th century. That did not happen in the beginning of this nation. In fact, when the, the Puritans and Calvinists came and, and, and established the colonies, all right, they intentionally resisted bringing any iconoclasms, all right, from Europe that were birthed in the Catholic Church. So there were no identities in, in, in artwork or statues or anything else all right, to represent Jesus. So that white picture of Jesus was not... No, that didn't come until the middle of the 1800s. That's all right? important. So in the early 1700s, when, their Christianity, uh, when Christianity came with the, the whites and settled here, it was easy for Indians and even uh, black slaves to embrace Christianity because it was, Jesus was, to them, a Middle Eastern. Right. They can identify with his suffering, uh, they can identify with his triumph over suffering through the resurrection. They can identify with the Exodus story. So it, it was easier for them, especially when Methodists rejected uh, slavery. Right. That made it very easy and opened the door. The whole Christian identity of America is something that developed over time and intentionally, beginning in the middle of the 1800s. But it's in the 1900s, especially uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s, as a reaction to the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal, which was considered by many uh, right evangelical and conservative Christians to be the introduction of socialism into America, you know, they pushed back. So you had all of these movements and organizations that were formed to intentionally get Christianity and the Christian God into American society in ways of its, its ceremonies, its rituals, its practices, its organizations, its money, etc., to try to affirm it as a Christian nation. They actually tried to present legislation to make it constitutionally a Christian nation, but it failed. See, mm -hmm. so America is Christian in ceremony and culture. Right, right. And it, look, many of us might agree with the push to try to make it more of a Christian nation, but the problem was their white supremacy. That was really the root of it. I'll, I, I like to say it was white supremacy with little sprinklings of Christianity <laughs> on it. You know, because if, if they had not been racist about it, it, it would have been, you know, maybe it would have been a, better, a good thing. But I, 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 yeah, again, you know, if we were to put a different lens on, on the history of America, we, it would make more sense to us. So if we were to revisit American history through the lens of classism and racism as a tool to reinforce classism, then we would understand it better. Mm. All right? So America was originally white Anglo-Saxon Protestant designed for white male Protestants. Right. That was the bottom line. Right. Women didn't have rights. 
And even within American society, it's not until the early 1900s, again, the 20th century, that whiteness was enlarged to include many whites who were not allowed into it. Because, and, and again, whiteness is not a, 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 a color, it's a culture, right? Right. So that culture was designed for white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So when Jews came over, they weren't allowed to be part of whiteness in America. Uh, when the Italians, the Irish came over, they were not a part of it. It's not until America sought to broaden whiteness and its definition and now embrace these individuals, especially in the early 1900s, that we had this thing called white America. But prior to that, even that was divided. I love what you said earlier about whites really don't know the true history. A lot of whites, particularly Christians, <laughs> the true history of America. And I think that one of the, I think there's two major things that keep the American body of Christ, if you will, from uniting across racial lines. I think one is that we have two entirely different perspectives on American history, right? I mean, white Christians think it was this great Christian nation. African Americans have a whole different view of it. We think it was, it was terrorizing us, and it was. Secondly, According to the book Divided by Faith, which came out maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, Emerson, yeah. Yes, and they, they surveyed white and black Christians, and they found that white Christians view racism on an individual or personal level, whereas African Americans see it more so as a systemic issue. Obviously, it's individual as well, but as a systemic issue, which white Christians tend to deny. Do you agree that those are two of the major, if not the major, stumbling blocks to us getting unity I, in the body? Yeah, to a degree. I, I think the biggest problem is ignorance. Okay. Uh, and, you know, Jesus looked out at those who were crucifying on the cross, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So ignorance is the most violent element in human society. People can do some incredible things out of their ignorance. And I think that's part of what we see in American society. So I, I, America needs to revisit its history beyond the, the myths that were created, the fables that were created, you know, to make uh, everybody feel good about our nation and instill patriotism, etc. No, we've got to revisit that. So when we talk about uh, America being divided, especially in the context of Christianity, and the two perspectives on Christianity, black versus white, we have to look at how Christianity developed specifically in the black community. Okay. Because the, the, the black church, all right, its history was not the imitation of the white church. The, the black church established a parallel culture, Christian culture. They didn't look to imitate white Christian culture. All right, because for very obvious reasons. All right, so they developed a parallel Christian culture with their own hymns, their own worship style, their own preaching style. The church was the only independent institution that they had control over. There was a place of affirmation and respect. You know, brother so and so, sister so and so, deacon so and so. Uh, it it became the womb for the birthing of of uh, black schools education. The, the birthing of black entrepreneurial ventures because it was the first context in which blacks pooled their money in order to build. So it was their first collective development experience, right. building a church. Uh, it was a center for politics. It birthed arts, entertainment. So the relationship that the black community had with the church was somewhat different from the dominant society's relationship with their church. You see? So it developed parallel all right, but not in imitation. Can we bridge that gap realistically? Because I, I agree with you. If we can get white Christians to really just take an objective look at American history, I think they, I, maybe I'm being too, you know, uh, naive, but I think it would give them a different perspective. I think they see things on a, from a black perspective and that would enable us to unite more. Is that, is that, is that realistic? Or? Walk a mile in my shoes. <laughs> you got nothing to lose, right? Uh, so the song of the 60s, my generation goes, 
Um, yeah, I, I think that it's going to require um, humility, number one, and the kind of humility that allows whites to recognize white privilege. Okay. Because that's some feel that it makes them, puts them on a guilt trip. No, that's the reality. Right. There is privilege right. in American society historically. You know, and that privilege is what has led to structural racism. They don't want to hear systemic racism. Okay, structural we'll racism. Structural. <laughs> what is structural racism? It's simply uh, a, a, a set of societal practices putting one group in a better position to succeed while disadvantaging another group mm. intentionally. So when we have practices, policies, codes, all right, systems and structures that, that, that achieve that, thereby disenfranchising, uh, discriminating against and marginalizing uh, people of color, that's structural racism. Right. You know, you're in sports. You know that in order to dismantle these systems and structures, we have to make a concerted effort. Uh, you familiar with the Rooney Rule? Yep. Okay, the so NFL. the Rooney Rule was implemented at NFL in 2003, saying, okay, when you start looking at the fact that we don't, we don't have coaches of color, we don't have general managers of color, uh, we don't have individuals in high executive operational positions in the NFL, yet 70% of NFL players are black, right. all right? What's wrong with that picture? So, of course, Dan Rooney, you know, that was all about, yep. you know, uh, named after him, but it said that they now have a mandate that with all applicants, they have to have a certain percentage of black or Latino applicants. Right. And that has made a difference. So there are ways. And the fact that we even have to do that, that we need a Rooney rule, tells us that there are systems in place that continue to marginalize people of color. We saw, Pastor, with this last election, uh, the, the, the divide between black and white Christians was no more greater evidence than in, in the election. And we saw many white, and actually some of color as well, but many white prophets prophesying that Trump was going to win, right? Even after he had lost, <laughs> that he's still going to win. And a few black prophets. Right, right, right. <laughs> and and I've, said, I've said that those black prophets, in my view, my humble opinion, they're so influenced by their white leaders or, you know, uh, fathers in the faith or whatever, that they, they kind of go along with that thinking. But I was on a call with about 25 prophets uh, who, and we were discussing why they made these, you know, it, it was, it's chaos, you know, because it looks bad. It's a black eye on the church that you had all these so-called prophets making these false prophecies. And I said to them, and the major, overwhelming majority of them were white, and I said, look, I, I'm, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in prophecy and all that, but I said for the last two to two and a half decades, when I hear an American white prophet prophesy about a national or international event, I dismiss it. I don't even pay it any mind because in my view, most of them, I don't want to say every single one, but most of them only see through the lens of whiteness. Mm. So they, they only see American history through white eyes. And that's not how God is. Yeah. God sees it through black eyes, Native American. I mean, you know, he, he understands everyone's perspective and what everyone's going through. And so I said, even if you may hear from God, you're interpreting it incorrectly because you're only seeing it through the lens of whiteness. And that is why so many of these prophets got it wrong and get it wrong. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the theology that drives the prophetic environment of these individuals is where we have to look because most of them subscribe to a cultural dominion mandate. Mm. So they look at their responsibility all right, to direct the culture, to be the voice of God to the culture and tell it where it should go. 
So beyond just being a moral, redemptive, humanitarian, and prophetic voice to analyze the moral failures and deficiencies within the system when it, when it comes to issues of justice and fairness and equity, right, uh, and service, they take it a step further. So they believe that somehow if uh, Christians who subscribe to their theology are in positions of power, right up to the president, right. okay, then that is the mandate of God. That is the church, you know, taking the territory, storming the gates of hell. And essentially when we do all of that and convert the world into a Christian-run <laughs> planet, then we'll invite Jesus to come back. But the reality is that we can't do that. Right. It is only Jesus who can bring the surrender of nations. And even when he returns, according to scripture, there'll be nations who are still not subject to him. And he is going to bring judgment and organize that. So that theology drives their relationship with culture. And there are those who are fascinated by the ability to divine the future. Mm -hmm. You know, with scripture cautions against, you know, being able to tell what's going to happen. Uh, and unfortunately, many of them are driven by an ap uh, apocalyptic vision of American society that it's going to require the divine intervention of God in order to straighten the planet out. But, un you know, until then, we have this mandate to convert as many, not only individuals, but the culture itself. But again, it's through that lens of, 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 of white folks. So it ends up with apocalyptic paranoia as opposed to eschatological reasoning. Mm. So when you engage in eschatological reasoning, you're, you're taking the fact that the Bible is prophetic and it does speak to social issues and culture and nations, etc. But you put it in a perspective that doesn't create the kind of paranoia that these individuals create and, pass, uh, and prophesy. Right, yeah, that's 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 deep. That's that's deep. Um, I I think too in the church, we seem to have one of two. I don't know if extremes isn't the right word, but one of two perspectives. You have those that kind of focus on personal salvation, and holiness, and the morality that comes with that, and they ignore justice and social justice and all that. And then you have those that just focus on justice but ignore a lot of the individual morality that the Bible teaches as well as a, as a part of salvation. I, I think both are biblical. I think the, what's biblical is that both of them are part of the gospel. It, it, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I look, they worked in harmony. Both the apocalyptic vision of divine intervention of God and something called a progressive social reform vision. Those two things work together. You know, it, Jesus said that there is no higher value than the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. So he pointed everyone to that higher value. But at the same time, he fed the 5,000. Right, he fed right, the, right, the 10,000. Right. 10, so is he a socialist or is he a capitalist? <laughs> what is he? You know, where does he, where's he fall on that? Right, right. It is not, it's not either or. It's both and coming together. So, and that was how things began in the 13 colonies, all right? Jonathan Edwards was a big, you know, expositor of that reality coming together. But the Civil War brought an abrupt end to that. And, and after the Civil War, you know, folks went in other directions. One group, they said that the only thing that's going to deal with all the issues, the social issues, is if we adopt a theology of progressive social reform. They took to the extreme and abandoned, you know, the role of, of the imminent return of Jesus and how that should affect how we live and our morals. Then the others went in another direction and said, no, this, this, Jesus has to come back real soon. In fact, he is. And we're going to have a great revival before he does to do everything we can we, to get people saved. And progressive social reform is not the gospel. So you end up with, a, and especially in the early 1900s, you end up with a social gospel, right? right? And you end up with a, a, the antithesis of that, a spiritual gospel, I guess. Right. You know, uh, people didn't want to hear just about the, the by and by in the future, he wanted to hear a now. And we've been divided politically since then. Right, right. Uh, we talked earlier about <clears throat> the, the negative uh, reputation of Christianity if you apply it to past American history and how saying America was a great Christian nation and 
the role of so-called Christians in slavery sullies the reputation of the gospel, particularly among African Americans. And we hear a lot of African Americans say, you know, they made us Christians in slavery to make us better slaves. You <laughs> were you, you you were a member, you know, of the Nation of Islam for for five years. Can you talk to specifically like a black person or a black man even about how? Because obviously you may have felt that way at some point when you were in the nation, but what is it about the gospel and Jesus Christ that despite negative history or what some people have, the way some people have mishandled or misused the scripture, led you to Jesus despite some of these negative things that have been done in the name of Christianity? Well, now we're talking about human nature. And as humans, we need identity. We draw strength from identity. We need a sense of belonging, a sense of pro approval. We need acceptance. I was growing up in Brooklyn in the 60s, and every revolution imaginable was taking place in America in the 60s. And I was growing up without a father. Uh, my father was, was white, who abandoned my mother and I. My mother, black, descendant of slaves in, in the Caribbean, in Panama. Uh, so here I am in that context, part of the desegregation program, bust out to white schools. So I'm experiencing two contexts of life, the black context in, in, in my neighborhood, in the hood, <laughs> and the white context in, in the school that I was attending. So it made me acutely aware of the two different experiences and realities that I was living in and that I was a part of. So in the absence of a father, the streets okay. fathered me. Older men in the community, etc. cetera, you know, uh, I was looking for, to belong. I was looking for identity. And in our community, because I would take the train to go up to Harlem to my, my aunt's, uh, where my aunt lived up there, because I would stay with her sometimes in the summer, and you see the guys in the bow ties. You, you see, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's when I began to explore uh, the Nation of Islam and what it meant. And it provided identity, strength, order, discipline. And essentially, Elijah Muhammad became a surrogate father mm. to so many black men, especially black men, whose lives were transformed. But it was a moral religion, right. all right? right. Uh, if I can call it that, because it was a combination of Christianity, Islam, uh, Jehovah Witness, uh, you know, numerology. Black nationalism. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff mixed up in it. You know, um, so I gravitated to that. And he was speaking uh, truth. And at that time, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan began to emerge as the national spokesperson. And uh, uh, Elijah was alive because, you know, I, I got saved and converted to Christianity in 1975. That's the same year that he, that he died. Uh, right. So I was there while he was still in power, and Mr. Farrakhan was predominantly the spokesperson, and um, it was resonating with me. I could see the inequities, the deficiencies in the systems and structures when it came to people like me, and um, I, I I saw them as responding to it. Mm -hmm. And I was also looking for God. You know, I grew up Catholic. But I went to different churches. I, I, I joined a Methodist church so I could play CYO basketball league. You know, <laughs> I did whatever. So God was convenient for me. Uh, but I was still hungry. And somehow I knew intuitively that truth, reality, and God were synonymous. So if I found one, the others two should be present. I found a degree of truth in the nation when it came to the injustices perpetrated against people of color. I, I, I found a, 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 a reality that demanded the best of me personally, uh, discipline, uh, dignity, you know, self-esteem, self self-worth, assurance, all of those things. But I didn't find God. Mm. And I could not embrace the notion that the white man was the devil, thereby scapegoating white people when I understood clearly that it was the system mm -hmm. and whoever was in power, because I, I, I saw, you know, the question is, can, can a black person be racist? Absolutely. <laughs> Racism is the intentional violence, oppression, hostility, mm. actions 
that marginalize, discriminate against, uh, and disenfranchise black people. Can a black person in a position of power engage in that? Mm. Absolutely. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, they're black, but they're racist right. against their own people. Right. So I understood its systems and structures and the people who occupy the positions of power within those systems and structures. So that was good. I, I, I was able to make that distinction. So as I continued in the Nation of Islam and understand the doctrine, I then realized that the nation is better understood not as a religious movement, but as a social protest movement against the failure of the white Christian church to address the socioeconomic plight of blacks in this country. Wow. Elijah Poole was birthed out of um, black nationalism. Marcus Garvey, right. out of which came the nation and the Rastafarian movement as, as well. So I understood it more as a protest movement. But within that five years, Christianity kept coming up in some very significant ways, some very supernatural ways, that God was, just, you know, step by step leading me to that moment that I would surrender to him. And when I got saved on January 11, 1975, you know, that night in that service, two things hit me. Number one, I'm the God that you're looking for. I knew intuitively it was Jesus. No one could tell me why or different. That was it. It was a, a settled disposition of heart and mind. Secondly, I and my word are one. That was critical because it took me away from all of the iconography that mm -hmm. represented Jesus, all the white portraits and paintings and movies, etc. It took me to the word. And the word became Jesus to me. Mm. That began to settle issues of race, discrimination, you know, marginalization, all of that. And I realized that people could take that same word and misuse it. So a hermeneutic of, of segregation, but also a, a deficiency in the doctrine of sin that sees sin primarily in the individual, but not in systems and structures created by those sinful mm. individuals that end up in oppression and marginalization and discrimination uh, and disenfranchisement of certain people. Right. So that's all part of the white evangelical theological experience here that reinforced racism. I'm gonna, and that's so powerful. And, and you know, I, interu I interact with a lot of brothers in the conscious community, you know, Muslims, Kemetics, Hebrew Israelites, all that. And I tell a lot of them, you're going to get saved, <laughs> you, you know, because that's black history. You know, there are so many former Muslims and Black Panthers and, you know, yeah. radicals, if you will, yeah. that come to Christ. That first, they denounce Christ in the church, and then they come later. And so your, your story is just another example of that. Um, I would like to end this way. Can you get, what advice would you give to first a black Christian on, or a black Christian or the black church, if you will, on how we can unite across racial lines in the body of Christ? And then what advice would you give to a white Christian or the white church about the same thing? Like, how, how can we do it? Uh, I know I, that's a huge <laughs> <laughs> million dollar yeah, question. I'm going I'm to I'm solve racism in <laughs> seven minutes. Well, you know, first, first of all, the oppressed have a responsibility as well as challenge to not only inform themselves but to educate their oppressors okay. because it's out of that ignorance that oppression takes place right yep that's good so the oppressed have a responsibility to inform themselves but also to educate their oppressors that can be challenging because you have to deal with ignorance denial and indifference mm. ignorance can be willful or culturally induced. And much of what white America experiences is culturally induced ignorance. That's how they grew up. Right. They grew up thinking, being taught in an environment where white privilege rules, uh, blacks are inferior, everybody's inferior to whites. You know. So if you grow up with that, you embrace that that's reality. Right. That's true for you. All right. So that has to be dismantled. Uh, the students, you know, the oppressors, right. the oppressors, the students that we have to deal with is a challenge. Ignorance, uh, denial. The prophet uh, Jeremiah in 614 in the Living Bible said, you cannot heal a wound 
by saying it's not there. And there are those who want to deny that there's racism in America. Right. They deny systemic racism or structural racism. You know, that's, that's individual. It's, it's per person. No, it's a system. Right. Uh, and, and thirdly, so you've got ignorance, you've got denial, and you've got indifference. There are those who are satisfied with the status quo because they're the dominant society. So if you're in power, right. you care less. Right. Well, it's not bothering me, so y'all just go. They're not going to say that publicly, right. but yeah, you know you I'm feel fine. that. I'm right? fine right here. We, we, you know, we're good. We're right. good. Right. So we, we, we have to deal with that. So I say to black people that we can't do it on their own. Look, we're only 13% of the population, all right? We need the help of the dominant society in order to affect change. That's the reality. So unlike like the nation, you know, back in the days, Elijah Muhammad taught uh, that we need to establish our own black state within America. And that sounds wonderful, but then you have to think about commerce. You're, talk, you're talking about trade. You're talking about governmental systems and structures, education, et cetera. And I'll tell you something, they hoarded us into the projects. All, they, all we need to right. do is let them hoard us into one, <laughs> one geographic location. You know, they were really in trouble. So, so we have to rethink these things, uh, and they're not these simple answers. So to, to black folks, we have to understand that we have a responsibility to not only inform ourselves, but to educate white folks about this. All right? And white folks have to, number one, humility, recognize white privilege. All right? Empathy. There's a need that, that white folks have empathy. Uh, and empathy is not something that can be taught. It's, it's facilitated through an informed conscience. When that conscience is informed about the context and history of black people, now you can experience empathy. Now you can understand better their plight and what it's going to take in order to address what has been created as a result of that. So you're talking about humility, you're talking about empathy, a spirit of collaboration, the fact that we have to work together in order to make it happen. There's not going to be one institution or organization that's going to change it all. No, we have to work collectively uh, together. And, and, and lastly, the moral courage. It's going to take moral courage in order to speak up, especially white folks, to speak up against these injustices in these inequities. Don't turn your face because it's not affecting you right. because sooner or later, you know, James says, sin metastasizes. It doesn't stay in one section. Right. It begins to affect the whole. So I think that's where we have to begin the conversation. And I, and I don't think that whites should be afraid that we, you know, we want to desegregate the white churches in America. No, right. we read Emerson's uh, research. You know, there's only a small percentage of, of the churches in America that are essentially uh, multicultural or multiracial churches, and most of them are led by whites, mm -hmm. you know, white mm -hmm. leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, people naturally gravitate to where there is commonality. And that begins with race. Right. You know what I mean? Ethnicity, custom, language, culture. Right. You know, that's where it is. And, and, and all ministry is contextual. So if I'm in a predominantly white context or an all-white context, I can't expect to reflect a diverse congregation. Right, right. Well, I'm going to bust some folks in <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just to make it look sure. like, you right. know, yeah, we're representing heaven. No, that's, that's not authentic. Yeah. That's not real. But I do think that there has to be a curriculum that sensitizes everyone to the realities of the other and the other's experience in America. So every white church should have a curriculum talk about the history and context of the black experience in America. You sh I'm sure you interact with a lot of white evangelicals. I do as well. Um, I, I, the gospel, I think, gives us hope. There's no doubt we're optimistic because of the gospel. But how optimistic are you that the church can bridge these gaps and be one as Jesus called us to be? I don't think that we'll ever fully deal with the divide because of human nature. Sin. We're darkened. We're selfish. You know, uh, love and justice is not the kind of priority that our nature creates, fallen nature creates, even when we're born again, if I, you can use that language, to uh, an experience of transformation. We still have to go through the renewal of our mind, right. transformation right. of our, our thinking. You know, so I don't think until Jesus comes back that we will see a complete uh, uh, coming together and unity. But I think that we can work towards that. I think that's our responsibility because the scripture teaches that we should put first the spirit of unity, especially when it comes to church and the people of God. And, and again, that takes conversation. It, it takes, you know, the willingness to, to come together and to share 
a set of values, etc. Uh, I think that's where it really begins. Well, this was great, Pastor. I, I thank you for your knowledge. I mean, that's that's decades worth of, of wisdom right there. Yeah, and my so, pleasure, uh, man. I yes, think thank you very more much. conversations like this yeah. need to exist. Because unfortunately, the wrong voices tend to have all the microphones and the platforms. Right, right. We need civil discourse where we can reason these things. And, and I think if we, if we have it across racial lines, whites, blacks, it, other races, we have to be willing to... I think we have to give grace in that if so-and-so says something that might offend me, give grace, because like you said, it may be coming out of ignorance, right. and I can educate them. Right. Uh, and also, we have to, white, black, we have to be willing to uh, be offended. Like maybe I'm going to hear something that might offend me. Right. But is it true or not? Is it scriptural or not? And that's really what should be the bottom line. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And let me just a ray of hope. Uh, back in the 60s, we saw police releasing dogs on civil rights workers, including children. We saw firemen releasing water through those hoses, full blast. That thing knocked you off your feet. That, those were the images that we saw on national television. So America was pricked in its conscience. And it was brilliant that Dr. King would appeal to the conscience of American society. All right? But in reaction to the necessary changes, like uh, coming up against discrimination in housing, uh, jobs, you know, et cetera, much of white America, segregationist right, white America, doubled down. So we became even more divided mm. as a result of bringing this to the forefront. But here it is, some 50, 60 years later, and we have the image of George Floyd right. under the knee of a police officer. For the first time in American history, we witness a national consensus of moral outrage to that kind of injustice and inhumane treatment of black people. That says a lot. We've come a long way, and that's a ray of hope. So white pastors, et cetera, were calling saying, this is outrageous. This is not us. What can we do? Right. See, right. that's the difference. Now, if we can take that spark of hope, turn it into a flame, then we can see some of the changes that are necessary. Amen. No better way to end <laughs> than that. <laughs> it's been great, brother. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate it. Blessings.